Hi, Albert Liu here, inviting you to join me and Rick Rule at the 2022 New Orleans Investment Conference, October 12th through 15th. Link in the description below. Welcome to Rule Investment Media. I'm Albert Liu here with Rick Rule uh, for episode three of the Rule Classroom. Rick, how are you? I'm fine, Albert, and thank you once again for causing this to occur. I'm getting many fond emails describing the utility of these courses for people, which makes me very happy, and thank you for that. Well, thank you, Rick, on behalf of everyone watching. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I, I think people have been waiting for something like this for quite some time. Um, last week, we talked uh, about the majors, and uh, we covered a lot of ground, but left a lot on the table, Rick. So we're going to spend another uh, installment here on the majors. Uh, what would you like to cover first? I think the first thing that we should talk about, the logical extension of we talked about last week, is balance sheet flexibility. Um, we talked about price projections. We talked about buying out of favor stuff. We talked about price versus cost. We talked about discount rates. I think that people, in order to make a sensible investment in the majors, need not merely to buy the low cost producers, but they need to, to understand the balance sheet, the balance sheet flexibility. This is a capital intensive business. Do companies have access, adequate access to credit? What size are the credit lines? In terms of their existing balance sheet, what sort of duration is there? Do they have a repayment event coming up, a bullet? Do they have access to the capital that they need to make sustaining capital investments? Do they have access to the capital they need to make new project investments? Do they have surplus capital, which is to say free cash that they can use to return to shareholders? either by way of dividends uh, or buybacks. So this balance sheet flexibility is very important. A subtler thing to look for is cost of capital. Do the credit markets look at an issuer as being, one issuer as being substantially riskier than another, uh, which is reflected uh, on the income statement in terms of the cost of debt capital? but also the cost of equity capital. Uh, managers that are regarded as very high quality managers, companies that run excellent balance sheets often sell for higher price earnings ratios, which means that they have a lower equity cost of capital. So balance sheet flexibility, uh, the adequacy of capital, the duration of the capital, the access to capital, and also the cost of capital are determining competitive advantages in capital intensive businesses. Uh, that's something I wish that we would have been able to discuss a little bit last week, and I hope that people pay real, real attention to it. Um, Rick, can you give us a hypothetical example of maybe two companies, one in a good balance sheet situation, one in a poor balance sheet situation, so we can compare and contrast? I mean, a, a good balance sheet would generally be a company, uh, an investment grade company, uh, where debt as a percentage of total assets on the balance sheet was less than 25% of book. Uh, it would be useful too if the median duration of that debt was fairly long, which is to say that they had funded a substantial amount of that debt in the bond market rather than with banks in a conventional revolving credit facility. The reason for that is that revolving credit facilities in periods of time where credit gets tight can be revoked for uh, less good reasons than you think. Uh, a good company might have a median duration of bonds of seven or eight years, which is to say they don't have a bullet repayment for seven or eight years. A bad company may have a bullet replacement, uh, a bullet repayment this year uh, or in a year and a half. You want to avoid unpleasant surprises with regards to access to capital. One of the things you look at is that there are some fairly large companies that don't have investment grade balance sheets, which is to say they can't finance new projects uh, with the prime interest rate as a reference, but have to get limited recourse financing against the project, which is substantially more um, expensive. So uh, in that sense, the credit market itself is passing a credit judgment on the company that can uh, save the novice investor a substantial amount of time rather than doing the credit analysis himself or herself. Uh, a, a company with in a capital intensive cyclical business with debt that exceeds 50% of total funded capital uh, begins to get in the risky category unless the company is enjoying very, very high returns on equity. 
there will be circumstances where the book value of a deposit substantially understates the cash generative abilities of the project. There have been projects that I have seen in my life where a billion dollar capital expenditure generates seven billion dollars in free cash flow. There have been other projects and, and that that project would be carried on the books, of course, a billion dollars less depreciation. There have been other projects I've seen in my life where a billion dollar cost of capital doesn't earn out the cost of capital. But until write downs, uh, that that project is carried on the books uh, <coughs> still for that same billion dollars. So when I say that it's useful that indebtedness not exceed 50% of total funded capital, it's also important to have a rudimentary sense of what the return on equity is so that you can tell whether a company is actually over or under leveraged. <clears throat> okay. Thank you for that. Very helpful. Um, another thing that I like to look at because so much of <clears throat> the future value creation, but also the cost of capital goes to management reputation. <clears throat> Pardon me, Albert. I want to know that the past successes that the company gets credit for were achieved by the current managers. There are circumstances in my life where companies have had very good reputations, but where there has been substantial turnover in the executive suite and where it becomes problematic for me to determine whether the current management team uh, deserves the reputation, the expectation of success that they enjoy in the market. There are other companies that have very long-term cultures uh, of success that have uh, defined, I would say, cultural advantages over the companies that deserve that very high reputation. But it's important to note with regards to cost of capital that there are certain companies who don't enjoy low cost of capital that probably should. There are other companies that uh, enjoy a very low cost of capital that probably <clears throat> shouldn't. When you are looking at a company, it's important to differentiate uh, between what that company's, what those companies' franchises are. <clears throat> One example would be, of course, the, the finest gold company on the planet, which is Franco Nevada, a royalty company. They are able to operate that company on a management express, expense ratio that's less than 1%, which is to say they run the company on less than 1% of the total revenues generated. In addition, because they don't have any operations, they don't have any sustaining capital uh, expense, what that means is that their gross is their net. The third thing that you look at with regards to Franco that makes it such a superlative company uh, has been the real continuity of managers. Uh, the current CEO has been at the company <laughs> most of his adult life, uh, and, and one of the founders of the company, uh, Pierre Lassonde, is still uh, active in the company. You look for a uh, franchise, which is to say durable competitive advantage. You look at continuity of management. And in particular, you look at whether the management that's in place enjoys the reputation or should enjoy the reputation, deserves the reputation that the company itself enjoys because all that goes to cost of capital. Um, Rick, one of the things that you highlighted at the end of the last video uh, when I asked about the risks associated with these companies, you said, well, the, the management will make mistakes. Uh, the management will make poor decisions. I know that Warren Buffett says that a really great company can be run by basically fools. Um, and, and so apparently a uh, large mining company is not one of those co great companies that can be run by fools. Where on the spectrum would you put it, though, in terms of difficulty level, importance of the management team? <clears throat> Uh, I would say it's critically important. Uh, let's say that your business is that you produce Clorox bleach. Uh, you have produced Clorox bleach using the same process for 70 years. You have obtained your feedstock from the same group of performers, uh, producers for 70 years. You have sold your product to the same end user through the same distribution channel for 70 years. The sustaining capital investment decisions are low because there isn't any. The new project expenditure uh, decisions are de minimis because there isn't any. Uh, not much changes. The need to make good decisions is low. In a capital intensive business where your product always depletes to the point that it doesn't exist anymore, there are fairly frequent uh, <clears throat> challenges. There are fairly frequent decisions that you have to be made. And unfortunately, many of them are critical. 
So I would say in capital intensive cyclical businesses, preparing for downturns, preparing for upturns, uh, segregating uh, high quality sustaining capital investments from low quality sustaining capital investments, and in particular choosing merger and acquisition expenditures and major project expenditures well is critical. Okay, great. Um, on to the next topic, Rick. What do we have next? Free cash flow. Uh, an income statement item that goes along with the balance sheet. Does, we're talking about major companies now. Don't confuse yourself with us with the juniors because they don't have any cash flow, free otherwise. Uh, free cash flow means the amount of money that's left over after the required sustaining capital investments and every, any scheduled new project investments. This is money that can be used to grow the company or to be returned to shareholders. This is the other side of financial flexibility. The first side of financial flexibility is balance sheet flexibility. This is uh, income statement uh, or earning statement flexibility. Uh, normally, uh, companies in their annual report and sometimes in their quarterly reports will differentiate between after-tax earnings, pre-tax earnings, EBIT, EBITDA, cash flow, and free cash flow. All of those numbers are important, but probably the most important number for you is free cash flow. Free cash flow, understanding free cash flow, while at the same time understanding balance sheet flexibility, tells you what the company has to do, uh, what the company can do, and what the company might be able to do and talks about the company's ability to maintain its current production and current levels of cash flow, to grow uh, by taking on new projects or, or buying other companies, or to return capital to shareholders. Free cash flow is a, a very important determinant of the duration for which you will hold your investment. Okay. Um, well, what, what about the idea of... Um you know, cash flow being low because because of the opportunity that you have, uh, that that it goes down at, at in at certain intervals when the the prospects are just too good. That certainly happens, um, but that well, two things about free cash flow. First, free cash flow falls for everybody during periods of time when commodity prices are low, uh, and, and then you don't concern yourself solely with free cash flow at the enterprise level, but relatively free cash flow versus industry competitors to see who has the most financial flexibility during the times when capital expenditures might be expected to generate the highest life of cycle returns. Uh, understanding something about the utilization of free cash flow is something that we'll discuss in a moment. Uh, what, what's important to determine before you grade the company on its capital deployment plans is whether or not it will have any capital to deploy. Uh, that is to say, balance sheet flexibility and free cash flows flexibility. So let's get into that. Uh, one of the things that's important in resource-based businesses, particularly when they're coming out of a bad cycle into a good cycle, is their ability to grow in the near term and in the intermediate term to take advantage of the outlook, the positive outlook that hopefully you might have for the commodity sector that you've invested in. Free cash flow and financial flexibility does this, but it's very important to pay attention to what the company says are their investment metrics uh, and also to have them describe the level of sustaining capital investments that their existing projects require and what the new capital uses are uh, and how those capital uses are determined. Very recently, Albert, I interviewed the CEO of Endeavor Mining, which has been a hugely successful African gold producer. And he told me the primary investment metric in capital allocation was measuring the return on capital employed uh, at a project with merely using that same capital to buy in existing shares of Endeavor. In other words, was the capital deployment that he planned on projects uh, accretive on a per share basis or dilutive on a per share basis? It's very important that you align yourself with managers who don't grow for growth's sake, but rather are growing uh, in terms of total return for you as an investor. 
on a per share basis. Basis. The best metric to gauge a management team by is a metric that says we will allocate to cap to allocate capital to acquisitions or project ex, uh, investments only when those allocations are accretive to us on a per share basis. There are businesses that look at the future uh, with such trepidation that they favor return of capital to shareholders uh, over new project investors. Or perhaps uh, it's the investors themselves as a class that look at the outlook, outlook for the sector and they ask the companies to defer new project expenditures and some sustaining capital investments in terms of returning capital to investors. The oil and gas business right now is a wonderful circumstance. The political class who three years ago wanted to consign the oil and gas business uh, to the buggy whip category uh, have suddenly found out that voters uh, like to drive and they like to stay warm. And so the political class now uh, is asking the oil and gas industry to increase its investments that can generate near-term supplies and bring down prices, while at the same time saying by 2030 that these businesses will be obsolete. The consequence of that, of course, is that many institutional investors are taking the big thinkers at their word and asking the oil industry to decapitalize to defer new project expenditures, minimize sustaining capital uh, expenditures, and maximize uh, returns to shareholders. Well, this is a lot of fun in the near term. What you do is you cannibalize the capital base of the company. And a prudent investor who understands, as an example, that peak oil demand probably occurs in 2035 or 2040, will look, for example, to an oil company that generates enough free cash flow that they absolutely make their sustaining capital investments, those investments that are necessary to maintain current production, current cash flow, that they utilize sufficient capital on project investments so that they can grow at reasonable rates relative to other producers, while at the same time compensating investors either through dividends or buybacks or both for the political risk that investors uh, experience in the oil and gas business. There's no one size fits all answer, Albert, but it's important to balance free cash flow uh, with the uses that the management team intends to deploy that cash flow uh, towards, and particularly the, the me metrics that they use in capital allocation. Okay, uh, next point. Uh, we've covered uh, part of it in the sector we just went through, which is to say opportunity to grow. It's important that you recognize that the natural resource business is not a bakery or not a Clorox. It's not something where you build a factory and inputs come in the front door and product goes out the back door and it goes on for time after time after time. That's not the way it works. In extractive businesses, your business gets smaller every day you mine. It's important to remember that. And what differentiates a good management team from a bad management team is how that management team manages the annuity, which is to say the production from its current assets, how it maximizes the current assets with intelligent sustaining capital investments, but also how it, op how it identifies and uh, prosecutes opportunities to grow. There are companies that have a facility for mergers and acquisition. It's part of their DNA. They're transactional. They do it well. They acquire assets, as an example, at the bottom of the cycle. They acquire assets that have been cash starved, which is to say have had insufficient amounts of sustaining capital invested in them. They invest that sustaining capital investment in them. They show the project some love and some money too, and are able to pull uh, inordinate returns out of those projects. If you find one of those companies and the management team has that skill set in place, you can be more assured than would otherwise be the case that your company uh, has the ability to grow in the future. But growing in the future is what you look for. I remember back, uh, Albert, to the decade of the 1980s when I did much more formal analysis in the oil and gas business. Uh, and I, and more particularly our mutual friend, Jeff Howard, looked at the performance of oil and gas companies by various performance matrix, ma matrices, pardon me. And, and I remember uh, stumbling on the fact that Freeport-McMoran was number one, two, or three 
in exploration production efficiency in the Gulf of Mexico in every major performance category. And when you added all the performance categories together, uh, they were the most efficient producer in the Gulf by a country, country, mile. Determining then that that company had durative, competitive, cultural and technological advantages over other companies allowed me to my great benefit to be a Freeport McMoran shareholder for 12 or 15 years until those advantages disappeared. So it's important to understand something about what the company's intellectual and cultural franchise is, what their development pipeline looks at, what they're good at, what they're bad at, uh, and use that as a sort of a, an intangible to add on top of the work that you've done with the balance sheet and the income statement. The opportunity to grow is something that you look at after you've looked at the uh, ability to survive. Rick, if you, if you don't mind sticking with that example for a second here, what were some of those advantages or the categories of advantages that you saw? Um, recycle ratio, which is to say the amount of new oil and gas reserves which could be discovered and developed uh, with the unit of existing production. In other words, if Freeport produced a barrel of oil in the Gulf, their margin on that barrel of oil was enough to add 1.75 new barrels <laughs> to the balance sheet, an extraordinary recycle ratio. They didn't need to go outside the company at all. And it was uh, an advantage, a technical advantage that existed not for a year or two years, but for 10 years or 12 years. Uh, the second was simply production costs. Freeport didn't concern themselves with technical successes, very small discoveries that cost a lot to produce. They concerned themselves with taking exploration risk, but finding really, really, really big reserves, which were fairly low cost to produce. Freeport, too, uh, didn't try to be all things to all people. You didn't, you didn't see them in every block sale in the Gulf. You saw them in parts of the Gulf that they understood, but more importantly, parts of the Gulf where they had existing production assets. The best place to discover an oil field is underneath or adjacent to an existing oil field. So you don't have to build a new billion dollar production platform. Uh, Freeport excelled in category after category after category. Interestingly, these advantages that Freeport enjoyed, they didn't enjoy in other producing terrains in the country. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico was in their DNA, uh, and if they uh, and to Freeport's credit, they said in analyst meetings, uh, "We are very, very, very good at one thing, and we are not so good at other things. Uh, and rather than fix our flaws in the other things, we're going to divert capital from those things to the things that we're very, very good at." <laughs> uh, an example that I always loved. Right. And then the loss of that advantage, was that merely exhausting a resource or was that a copycat phenomenon? Other people doing the same thing? What happened? Why did you exit? Uh, the uh, efficiency for what they did in the Gulf of Mexico <clears throat> began to go away, while at the same time, the returns that they began to enjoy from their gigantic copper gold discovery at Ritzburg Grassburg were so high that they began to divert capital from their oil and gas and sulfur operations in the Gulf uh, to their copper gold uh, operations in Indonesia. They were honest enough with themselves to say, we're the best in the world of the Gulf of Mexico, but Indonesia generates a higher return for shareholders than the Gulf of Mexico does. <clears throat> so they cannibalized operations where they were the best in the world to uh, pursue an opportunity that which they thought was a higher quality opportunity. Most companies wouldn't do that. Most companies would go raise fresh capital for Indonesia while continuing their other operation. Freeport was honest enough to measure return on capital employed on a share by share basis. Right. Okay. All right. Um, going down the list, uh, what do we have next? I think we're, uh, we're using up uh, most of this discussion. I would only return to the first part of the discussion that I had to say with regards to beta versus alpha and also uh, large cap companies. In capital intensive cyclical businesses, the upside that you enjoy by having the guts to buy when a sector is out of favor is extraordinary. You don't have to take special risks out of that. If you have the guts to go into a sector that's in liquidation, 
where that product is necessary for the well-being of humankind, you will do well. You will do well. You will experience some bumps in the road. You may get in, as I always do, too early. You may run into circumstances, little inconveniences, like a war, a political risk. But the truth is that in buying low and selling high is a wonderful roadmap to success. Similarly, you will come to a time when you feel highly intelligent for the decision that you made, where all of the factors that you consider worked out in your favor. And what happens when prices rise is that the fact that the prices have risen reinforces the validity of your thesis in your mind, particularly if you have been challenged along the way. Uh, you like the fact that the stock has gone up. It makes you look smart. But the truth is, uh, if all of the reasons to own a stock have been fulfilled, it is likely that people who weren't as aggressive with you during bad times are crowding into the stock too. And it's likely that the remaining room in that stock is low. When you start feeling really smart, think about selling. Don't use up your time in the business. Understand that this may be five years or six years or seven years. I'm not talking about swings that take place over months because mostly the bigger mistake that people make is that they don't take into account compounding. Uh, it is important as long as the factors are intact that cause you to buy the stock, that you keep the stock. I've seen a lot of people buy wonderful companies like BHP or Rio at the bottom of the cycle, enjoy a, enjoy a double, say, thank you, Jesus, hit the bid, move on, and watch the stock go up three or 400%. And by the way, miss out on dividends that may have exceeded their original purchase price. Uh, if you are actually right, not psychologically right, if you are actually right, sit tight. The best, best, best factor of financial markets is compounding. Uh, having a succession of yes answers, having a virtuous circle with regards to higher commodity prices, greater production, uh, improved balance sheet, improved returns to shareholders. Allow this to happen. If you're right, allow yourself to be right. Take your money out of the sector when sober reflection tells you that the price of the equity more than reflects the future of the equity, particularly with regards to a different opportunity, which might be bottom of cycle. Rick, I, I feel like maybe the value investors as a class have been more prone to uh, missing out on the compounding than other investors. Either that or they're the only ones willing to admit it, uh, that they took the, they took the early gain. Uh, what, what have you seen? Understand that value investors, uh, the traditional value investor doesn't want to be in a capital intensive cyclical business. The traditional value investor wants to be right for the long term. The successful value investor wants to buy Clorox at six times earnings, 60% a book with a 6% dividend. That happens when the whole market is out of favor. But mines aren't Clorox. What you need to understand with mines is that they're capital intensive and cyclical. When they're out of favor, you buy them. When they return to favor, you sell them. <laughs> they are not Clorox. Uh, there are value investors like Warren Buffett that are beginning to drift into capital intensive cyclical businesses because he understands that his willingness to buy out of favor sectors gives him an advantage over others. And he also has come to understand that in a capital intensive business, the fact that he has lots of capital is a durable competitive advantage. You never would have seen Warren Buffett 20 years ago buy Occidental Petroleum or Philips or Chevron. They weren't his kind of business. As uh, his durable competitive uh, advantages changed, and in particular, as the biggest business in the world, the oil business uh, went on sale for dimes in the dollar, more traditional uh, value investors are beginning to be attracted to the space simply because they have come to see the Marty Whitman style uh, opportunity, the ability to buy peak of cycle earnings very, very cheaply. All right. Uh, and with that, we're out of time, Rick. Uh, pretty much right on time here. Thank you very much. And I uh, look forward to doing this uh, for the next installment. Uh, uh, a pleasure, Albert. I'll look forward to hearing from you what the viewers think we ought to talk about next. I have my own ideas, but I don't want to pollute the discussion.